Hi everyone. It is Wednesday, September 26th, 2018, episode 3. I am getting better at this, I think. I hope. Um, the sun is out, and I'm so excited, except now it's blowing out what my backyard looks like, so if the chickens start running through, you might not be able to see them. Um, but I'm hopeful that you can hear them because one of my roosters is crowing up a storm right now. All right, first things first, uh, works in progress. Um, my vanilla socks on Knit Picks Felici sock yarn in the Countess colorway. As you can see, I have made the heel flap and turned the heel and I'm ready to start the gusset. I It has been so long since I've made a heel like this. Well, not counting the last one. But I couldn't remember how I was arranging the stitches on the needles. And I tried researching a little bit on YouTube and I could only come up with magic loop and I didn't bother to watch any of those and <laughs> anyways I managed to figure it out on my own and it was a lot easier than what I think I used to do uh, way back when. I realized that it's been probably six years since I've consistently made socks with heel flaps and they fit my foot so much better. I I don't know if I want to go back to the afterthought heel. The uh, stitches, um, the stripes on the socks seem to be coming out okay too. I was a little worried about um, significantly uh, shorter stripes after doing the um, gusset, but so far this seems to be working out okay. And that has been living in one of my very first project bags that I made way back when, probably 10 years ago. When I pulled that out and I had my sock in it, my son goes, wow, that's been a long time since I've seen that. Well, yeah, and it's holding up really well. Um, Next thing I have is my Lakeshore scarf. And this has been living in um, a yarn bowl that one of my friends gave me for Christmas last year. Isn't that cute? And it's huge too. I don't, well, I don't know if you can really tell how big it is, but it it's really big and um, I like this little doohickey too and it the yarn doesn't stick in it or anything and it fits nicely on the arm of my couch let's see since I last posted I've done this much progress let's see if I can get this to show um, the last time I shared I had gone to the widest point and I was gradually working my way back. Boy, this stuck in it. I can't wait till it blocks out. Um, I may have to take a picture of this so you guys can see the shape of it, but it went out like that and now it's gradually coming back in. Um, the uh, yarn is Knit Picks, the Great Lakes colorway, and you guys remember when I said that I lost the ball band? Funny story. <laughs> the other night, I was messing with the yarn ball, and I saw a little something sticking out of it, and I thought, oh boy. That's where it's been this whole time. I was just a little too clever for my own good. So, uh, nitpicks, stroll fingering weight, hand painted. Um, like I thought it was. So I didn't lose it, I just misplaced it.
something. And I started something new on Saturday. I, I had to start something with different colors. And I seem to be a little bit on a Elizabeth Zimmerman kick. And you'll know a little bit more about that later. This, I'm using the Lion Brand Mandela Yarn in the Gnome colorway. And what I like about these ball bands is they show a little bit, oops, about what it, the stripes look like. That's nice. Um, so I picked up two balls of this yarn actually, and I thought one I could make for a boy and one for a girl. And right now, I'm making one for the little girl. Doesn't look like anything right now though, but it's orange. Kind of matches the outside, and I'm gradually transitioning into the next color already, which, let's see, you can see it's changing from orange to yellow. Uh, it's 100% acrylic. I don't mind working with acrylic yarn. I'm using, let's see, what do I... I'm using US 5 needles. Those are 3.75 millimeters. And I am on row 25. Um, I was using a pattern that a friend had sent me, and it has row by row instructions rather than me trying to uh, figure it out on my own because, um, well, if you've ever tried to knit a Elizabeth Zimmerman pattern, you know exactly what I'm talking about. She gives you the freedom to do your own pattern. She doesn't hold your hand very much on it. She says, this is, this is how it starts. Stay like this. Go on. Uh, <laughs> uh, what else did I want to say? Um, I can't remember. Oh. Well. Hopefully, um, this won't take me too terribly long. Oh, and then there was a little YouTube series, and I can't remember who posted them, but I think it was uh, City Knits something over in Michigan posted a YouTube series on how to, um, not how to knit the pattern, but kind of a guide, like this is, the size that it should be for this size, age of child and you know how the needles will affect the size and uh, how to mark the double decreases. I've knit one of these already and I remember struggling a lot with the double decreases and I'm not ashamed to say that that baby surprise jacket turned out huge and I did give it to a friend and I got to see the baby in it once although he was swimming in it and I would be surprised if he can fit into it yet because it just turned out so big. Um, well anyways the thing that I remember the most about working the pattern last time is that I couldn't keep track of which side that um, I needed to do the double decrease on. And that YouTube series recommended using, sorry, my computer keeps going to sleep, um, strings of yarn to mark the stitch where uh, you need to do the double decrease. And it, you know, if it's facing you, then that's when you need to do the decrease. Um, otherwise, on the other side, you don't see anything. Um, so that has been helpful for me. And I've also put the row marker on the side that I need to do the double decreases on. And uh, if I remember, I'll link to that video series in the show notes. And that this pattern is living in another bag that I sewed 
a couple years ago. It was a free class thing from Craftsy.com, how to sew your own bucket bag. And I've been very happy with this bag, although I don't use it as much as I probably should. But this this ball of yarn fits perfect in it, in which I gotta say, this this yarn, I don't know why, but it's popping out on the top and it just looks ridiculous to me. <laughs> I have done very little spinning, so I didn't even bother to pull the wheel out to show you. Uh, let's see, from the coop. Uh, I, I tried taking a few videos of Mama and the babies. They are doing just fine. And in fact, I think Mama's probably ready for a break from the babies. She Every time I go to the coop and I open up the door to check on the feed and the water situation. She kind of comes running and buck, 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 buck and at me. And I, I can tell that she wants to make a run for the door, but I don't let her. Um, when my, I was speaking to my neighbor a couple weeks ago and she had a, I can't remember if it was a hen or a duck, maybe both, hatch out some eggs and she let the babies and mama in with the main flock fairly early on which I've been worried that the big girls and the roosters will go after the babies so I haven't let them out yet but they might be ready they've got to be well they're at least two months old and they're in that awkward teenager phase where they've got almost all their feathers now but they're still little and awkward looking just like everybody was in their teenage years um, but they're they're starting to play act play acts not the right word but they're doing their little tussles to kind of figure out the pecking order and I think I've got at least two roosters because those two seem to go at each other quite a bit not like physically at each other but it Anybody who has chickens, you know, every once in a while, if they've got a skirmish or something, like the two chickens or roosters, they'll kind of face off and their neck feathers will flare out, try to make themselves look big and tough and intimidate the other chicken. So I've been seeing a little bit of that. I also noticed that one of the babies is, looks to be quite a bit bigger than the rest, so I'm guessing she or he, hatched out a day or two before the rest of them did, which is, which is fine. <laughs> but every time I tried to take a video today, since we have sun, which is wonderful, absolutely wonderful, I love it, uh, they, they'd either go running or they would just kind of stop and stare at me and they wouldn't do anything cute and adorable. So I don't know why chickens seem to know what you're trying to do when you're taking a video of them. So the rabbits did it to me too earlier today. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, we also, I had to take a trip to get chicken feed last week and that is a funny story that I wanted to share with you. Uh, usually, I have the same guy that comes and loads the chicken and feed into my vehicle every time, and he's always got to make a um, comment about it because he drives the same vehicle I do. And I think he forgets that he has this conversation with me every time. Well, t this last time... Uh, it was a different gentleman and, well, let me back up. I drive a Prius and there is not a lot of love for Priuses out there, which just drives me nuts. I, I People who don't 
actually drive Priuses or have any experience with Priuses. It, to me, it's kind of like where, similar but not the same, but where people hate Fords, but they love Mustangs. It's like, why do you love Mustangs? Well, they're Mustangs, but they're Fords. You say Fords are bad. Yeah, but they're Mustangs. Well, Priuses are Toyotas. Everybody loves Toyotas, at least as far as I know. Um, everybody I know has good things to say about Toyotas. The majority of the people I know drive Toyotas. Uh, anyway, so um, I do a lot of hauling of stuff with my car, and it's a lot of stuff that people wouldn't normally expect. So I went and got my order for the chicken feed and paid for it and uh, went to the backyard to get it and this guy comes out on one of the machines that, that has the little the lift in the front that can lift pallets and stuff and he's got a pallet there with my 15 bags of chicken feed on it and he rolls out and he goes, a car? And I hopped out and I said, yeah. I said, I've done this many times. I know exactly how much I can haul and this can haul all of that. And I said, put this much here, 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 and here. And he did. And he didn't say another word. And I was just giggling on the inside because I'm sure not many people see this. I've hauled lumber with my car too. It's, I well, I'm sure a lot of the people in the lumber yards and the little guard shacks are surprised to see one, a Prius, going in and going to get, you know, large and long pieces of lumber and two, uh, a girl who knows what she's looking for in the lumber yard. And I like to think that, you know, the guys are probably a little jealous that there's somebody out there who has a girl that knows how to do this stuff and can do it for them. So, um, loaded up my car and came home and unloaded it and we are set for chicken feed for a while. And somebody left a comment on the show notes for the last episode with a couple of questions about chickens. Uh, first one was, What's an egg song? Well, an egg song is when the hens are in the process of laying an egg or they've just laid an egg and they want to tell the whole world about it. And for some reason, none of my girls are doing any egg songs right now. I heard a few earlier today. Um, they just kind of like a cackling Although I had one hen that it sounded like she was saying, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, every time she laid an egg. And it was kind of funny in a sad way. Because um, I, I, I feel her pain, sort of. Uh, <laughs> and then the other question was, how do I keep track of the different chickens? Well, personalities and differences in the feathers of the chickens. Uh, I mostly have dark Brahmas. I've got some buff Brahmas and some Americanas. We've got one Americana that my son called Weeping Bell and she's very verbal and she likes people so she if she sees you outside and you've got something that might be of interest. I mean, she starts talking and she comes running towards you. And I know in a few chicken videos I've posted previously, you can hear her. I mean, her little voice stands out. And then we've got, I'm trying to think, Pontiac. Uh, the other chicken we have that was a baby of Grandma Peas. Well, she's all black, mostly black. But she's also, you know, the side of being ancient. And we don't have any other chickens that look like her. Uh, one of our favorite roosters 
that we've had who passed away not too long ago. Um, well, his name, we called him Mama's Boy because we could pick him up and put him in our lap and he'd be content to just sit there. He is very well-mannered and mild temperament and he was just, he was a good chick, chicken rooster. Um, but I always differentiated him from the other roosters is that Mama's Boy had one broken sickle feather. So that was the way that I was able to keep track of him. Because he didn't have much else that stood out for him. Now I'm trying to think if we have... Oh, we have another Americana that's similar looking to Weeping Bell. <laughs> and my son calls that hen bootleg weep Weeping Bell. <laughs> and he had to tell me that a couple of times before I realized <laughs> what he was saying. <laughs> bootleg Weeping Bell. Makes sense. Okay. Um, I think the first, the first time we had our first, well, when we had our first flock, it was mostly Wynadots, and they're, when you've got a small group of chickens, you can tell who's who after a while. Um, otherwise, you can use, uh, hen aprons or hen saddles. Although it's not recommended that you have those on your chickens all the time. Because those are to protect the chickens back when they're molting, losing their feathers and growing new ones. It's to help, if you have a rooster, um, it helps keep their back from being shredded when the rooster mates with them. So the rooster will jump on the hen's back and they've got... Um, I'm trying, I'm drawing a blank on uh, spurs. They have spurs. And depending on where, you know, the roosters put their feet, usually they are supposed to put them kind of on the, the hen's wings because that the hens will stick their wings out to kind of help brace the roosters. Um, but those spurs can rip up a hen's back if, if you don't do anything about it. Um, so if anybody has any questions about chickens, you know, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. And then from the hutch, uh, we've got two rabbits. I don't think I ever mentioned their names or um, said too much about them, but they're Haas and Pfeffer. And Haas is kind of a brown um, colored rabbit and pfeffer is mostly gray with a little bit of white. Uh, their, their fur is starting to change colors. They're, this is my first year owning rabbits. My husband had rabbits when he was little. So usually any questions I have I ask him and well is this normal? Do they usually do this? Etc. Etc. And he's good about answering the questions for me. Uh, we had them in the house for a couple hours over the weekend, and they are uh, litter box trained. I think 99% litter box trained. I mean, they fortunately their poo is not wet, so it's not gonna make a mess. But this time they they didn't do anything, and they. They start out running around the house and they're happy and they're kicking and jumping and playing and then after a while they curl up, well, yeah, curl up on the big footstool that we have and then just chill for the rest of the time. But I don't think we'll be able to bring them into the house much longer. Uh, we're, we don't want to do anything to prevent them from getting their winter coats since they'll need them since... Uh, let's see, you can't, if you can see, I'm in mirror image, so <laughs> that's why I'm like, what, what? Um, that right there is their hutch, and that's where, they're, where they will be spending their summer, um, or I'm not, winter, they'll be spending their winter, gosh. Uh, <laughs> Um, barefoot in the kitchen. 
Well, tonight I am going to be trying a new recipe for cauliflower mac and cheese. It's one that I spotted in one of my recipe groups on Facebook, and I thought I'd give it a try. Uh, I've tried a variation of this before, but it was in the microwave, and I'm sure that's not as good as it could have been because the cheese didn't get crispy. I'm hoping the cheese gets crispy. That would be awesome. Um, I've started the seasoning process for my big skillet. Uh, we we try cooking something in it, and naturally it's stuck. So scrape that all up, and there is one method that I found on somebody's Facebook wall that I tried for um, cast iron seasoning and it works and I'm really pleased with it because I've tried a few different methods and none of them ever worked for me. I mean, things kept sticking. Um, they, the, the seasoning was too thick on the bottom of the skillet and I never realized why that I should be um, have the skillet in the oven upside down oh let's see uh, well this weekend I'm going to have to make up a batch of cinnamon rolls to put in the freezer uh, I learned a few months ago that I could make up a batch of cinnamon rolls, portion them out, wrap them up in plastic wrap, and freeze them. And that way, when my son and I want cinnamon rolls, we don't have to have a whole batch of them. And I've never been keen on freezing baked goods after they're baked. It's just not not my thing I, I've never been fond of it and I had asked this question in one of my Facebook groups and oh boy a lady kind of chewed me out about it <laughs> that I was somehow um, tempting her when she was trying to be good but I, it was something that I'd never heard of before until I came across a blog somewhere and I thought oh wow has anybody ever done this so that's what I do I make up the dough in my bread machine and I portion it out so I have four cinnamon rolls and then we can have cinnamon rolls three times and it works out perfect my son can have uh, two cinnamon rolls you know one day and then the next day have the other two and I learned that I also don't need to make a whole batch of frosting for the cinnamon rolls either. I put cream, however much cream cheese I want, in the microwave and warm it up and I put a little bit of powdered sugar in with a little bit of vanilla and I suppose depending on how you feel about it you can put a little bit of butter in too and you stir it all up together and then you have just enough uh, frosting for your cinnamon rolls and I wish I had known that one way before, way before. Uh, see, book chat uh, well I finished the the um, speaker for the dead right after I recorded and I, I did put the request in for the book after that and then I discovered that there was a book in between Ender's Game and Speaker for the Dead. But the library's website called it Book Six. So I don't know what's going on there. But when you look on the label, or the book cover, I'm sorry, it says direct sequel to Ender's Game. And I don't know if there's something going on that I'm not aware of that one of the you know, some authors do weird things with, they'll write the story out of order, and then V.C. Andrews did this, started out with the story here, 
continued on, but then started, the last book was the book that should have been written first. Oh, well, unfortunately my audio book doesn't have a cover. Uh, I'll try to put that on the show notes too, but that just became available yesterday, and I was not expecting it because I thought it would be months before anything came in. I, oh, also available because, you know, when it rains it pours, uh, a book that I had requested probably a few months ago uh, became available, and it was Cat Trick, a Magical Cat's Mystery Book for uh, This um, series is about a gal who moves to a small town in Minnesota and becomes the head librarian, head library director, I'm not sure which. Um, but she came to be in charge of a library renovation for the library's 100th birthday, and it was one of the William Carnegie Libraries, so kind of a big deal. We have one of those in our big town uh, near me, and unfortunately it's sitting empty because nobody can decide what to do with it, so. Um, well, anyway, so she's got, she volunteers to go help with a colony of feral cats and two little kittens end up following her home and she finds out later that they have magical abilities. One can turn invisible and one can walk through walls. And of course they understand what she's saying and I love a good cozy mystery with cats. And I realized in the last few years that almost all the cozy mysteries have cats in them. Or maybe it's just what I'm, what I'm looking at right now. But it, my absolute favorite cozy mystery series is the Cat Who books by Lillian Jackson Brown, and that's kind of what I, I see. I live in my very own Moose County, um, but um, I know her books weren't necessarily the, the most well written, but that's okay. I love Coco and Yum Yum. Uh, the other, I'm still slowly working through Crossing to Safety. And if you notice, well, I say this now, but I'm really hopeful that this stays like this. I tried a different software, so now things won't be in mirror image. So now you can read Crossing to Safety, Wallace Stegner. I am on page 66 of 341 and now I have a little bit better idea of what the story is about. I've uh, marked a few passages that I thought were interesting. Uh, let's see, like the first one I... That's killer. Tell everybody he's here. <laughs> uh, oh. I wrote notes because I have a feeling that I will forget the some of the people's names. But the main characters are Larry and Sally Morgan and then Sid and Charity Lang. And Larry's the narrator of the story. And Larry and Sally are a young couple, not quite fresh out of college, but he's uh, accepted a job at UW Madison and him and his wife moved there from California and it's set in 1937 so just after the depression or there's still it's the tail end of the depression I'm not sure which uh, the story starts with a flashback to where the two couples spent many of their summers uh, and then Larry and Sid both work at UW Madison's English department and they they meet at at the school I think at a school function and uh, Charity goes over to visit Sally for a short bit and 
immediately invites them to come over to a dinner party that her and her husband are going to throw. And these two couples, they, it's an immediate friendship. Uh, Larry and Sally, they, they don't have a lot of money. You know, young couple, Sally's pregnant, I think about three months old at the time that they meet. And uh, Sid and Charity, they have been married longer. They've already got two kids. Charity's pregnant with her child, too, at about the same time uh, along in the pregnancy. And those two come from money. But they're, they're very not in your face about it, which is nice. They're very, like, this is what it is, you know, we... This is how we are, and they decide that they love this other couple, and they want to spend all their time with them. And I think what I put, it was Larry and Sally, uh, Sid and Charity welcome Larry and Sally with open arms and do what they can to include them in activities. Like, they don't, it's not held against them that they have money, and uh, Sid and Charity don't do anything to kind of remind um, Larry and Sally that they don't have much. They just kind of like, oh, you know, it's, we're going to do this thing. We have all this food. Why don't you come with us? Let's go have a picnic. And, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, and you don't have to bring anything. It's no big deal. Oh, okay. You know, these apples are fine. They'll make a great dessert. So, <laughs> um, one of the, the things that caught my eye already was, at the dinner party, there was this couple that came there as well, and I, uh, I think their nationality or ethnicity was pointed out, but I don't remember what it is right now. But they were not very nice people. They were kind of sour the whole time, and then something happened, and they took it personally, and they decided to leave early, and. Their names were Marvin and Wanda Ehrlich. And I've got a feeling that this incident's not going to be forgotten and it's going to come back later on down the road. And where I finished it off was that Sid let it be known to Larry that he has this desire to write. He wants to write poetry and write wonderful things, and his father, who was a banker, I believe, um, didn't have much, didn't think his son should uh, pursue that path. So now that he, his father passed away and he switched majors in college and now he's working at the college and he would like to keep writing but his wife wants him to climb the ladder, so to speak, and get tenure and um, get that security. And then they also want to do what they can to improve the town, which is kind of funny knowing what Madison is now versus what it might have been back then. And I'm, I'm kind of rambling on this time, but I realized I was just going to let this go and see what it, what it would wind up to be. And I see it's running a lot longer than what I expected, but I think I, my pace is getting a little slower because I'm getting more comfortable with stuff. And apparently I have a lot to say. <laughs> oh, you'd, you'd never guess. Yeah. Uh, nature notes. Uh, we are expect expecting our first hard frost on Friday. So that means I'm going to have to hurry up and clean out what I can out of the garden. And we have sun today, but it's cold. Uh, the wind is blowing. It's got a dampness to it. I had all the windows open, exchanging the air. But after a while, I had to close them all up and get the wood stove going because it was 55 in the house. It was, it was a little cold. Um, and since we haven't had much sun lately, 
I've been trying to take pictures of the fall colors, but with it being gray, the colors have not been turning out like I had hoped. And that's been a bummer. I've been paying particular attention this year for the fall colors, and they're beautiful, but they're not showing up on camera as well as I had hoped. And I know that's because there's so much moisture in the air and it's so foggy in the mornings. Because in the mornings I was pulling over and trying to take pictures and thankfully there's not a lot of traffic on the back roads. Um, so I'm still, I'm still crossing my fingers that I can take some good photos of nature's beauty up here. And from the homestead, well, I mentioned the the frost, and this last weekend, we let our son pick his watermelon, and it was perfect. And it's it was nice and red, very sweet because he let me have a piece, and otherwise I've been letting him have most of well, the rest of it, but really good. And I asked him if it was worth the wait, and he said yes. <laughs> uh, he's been going out to the deer stand most every night although it's been hard some nights because of the rain uh, no deer yet the deer have changed their routines and unfortunately some of them have gone nocturnal which bums us out but thanks to having the game cams um, they We've got at least one bear that has started hitting one of the back piles. And he's a big boy, too. And I don't know if we have any of the pictures still from that. Um, and we have a couple coyotes coming through, and they're eating the apples, which I, on the one hand, I think is kind of weird, but the other hand, not, because dogs eat carrots. So why wouldn't coyotes eat apples, right? And we've got a few raccoons coming through, too. And there's one. It was just adorable in its raccoon way. It was kind of sitting on its back, back haunches, and just kind of sitting there like Buddha and eating and doing that. Because one of the cameras switched over to movie mode, so we had these little video clips of, of the different things going on. So... Oh, gosh. <laughs> I've talked a lot, I realize. Uh, I thought a lot about what to call this part of the podcast. I wanted to say blather or babble, but I don't think either one of those was really appropriate because I'm kind of organized in what I wanted to talk about. But So I decided... Why not call it Coffee Talk because the, because the podcast stemmed from the idea of if we're having coffee. So um, I'm just going to call it Coffee Talk. And what I wanted to ask this week is that I realized the network TV series are starting up. Uh, I don't watch a lot of network television. There's just a few things that I am interested in. And we watched the series, um, the first one for Young Sheldon. And we started watching this because of my son's interest in it, even though he's never seen The Big Bang Theory or has had any interest in it. But for some reason, he wanted to watch Young Sheldon. And I said, okay. And I like that show a lot. I mean, it's good writers... The humor's funny without being dirty, and what I like, I think, the most of all is that it portrays a father-son relationship in a positive light. You know, the dad's there. He's not perfect. He does what he can to help his son, or sons, his kids. Um, it is, I, I like it a lot. You don't see that a lot nowadays. At least I don't think you do, because I don't watch many other shows. The other two that I watch on the network uh, stations is Survivor, which starts tonight, and I'm really excited for that. 
So I hope it doesn't disappoint me. <laughs> and um, that's BFR. Um, amazing Race. Although I have not been impressed with Amazing Race the last few seasons. He agrees. Um, and then right after Young Sheldon, I kind of got hooked into watching the remake of Magnum P.I. And I told myself I wasn't going to watch this, but it just kind of started playing and I was sitting there knitting and nobody else was paying attention or I guess cared enough to change the station. And I was strangely hooked onto it and I don't know if I'm going to keep watching it because they had, you know, all this tension and, you know, it, this terrible thing is happening and, oh my gosh, now the friend, you know, this has happened and now we're going to right that wrong and we're going to figure out why these people did that and that's really great, but I'm wondering how are they going to able to be able to keep that up week after week? Cause, I mean, that, you know, you can only stay up like that for so long. Uh, they changed Higgins to a girl, which I wasn't sure if I'd like at first, but she's um, former, retired, MI-16, M-16, whatever it is, the British secret intelligence thing. So she's kind of a badass, and she can do hand-to-hand -hand combat, and she, you know, she knows her way around stuff, and that's cool, but they... I'm not sure how to describe this. They, you know, they made the show hip and current, and I just, I don't know. It's, my one friend said she refuses to watch it because Tom Selleck was it for her, and a lot of times I don't care for remakes of TV shows, which I see they're doing a lot of now. But, yeah. Hard to say. Uh, I might catch it here and there, depending on um, if you, um, Sheldon stays on, I guess. Because I somebody shared a link on Facebook that young Sheldon had low ratings this last week. Which is sad, because I really like that show. And let's see, to wrap this up, I guess, because we are at 47 and a half minutes. Oh my gosh. Um, my happiness for this week. And I kind of had to think about this one a little bit, but at the same time not, because uh, it's been cold this last week or so. He must be right outside the window. <laughs> um, rice packs. I love rice packs, and this when it starts getting cold out, I immediately pull out. I make big ones. <laughs> See, he approves. Um, I put this in the microwave for like four minutes and it keeps warm almost all night under the blankets and I love it. I love it. So if you made it through you made it through all in one sitting, I love you. Uh, if you had to watch this in a couple sittings, I totally understand because I do that myself with uh, a few video podcasts that I watch. I I'm still trying to decide if I want to do this weekly or every other week, but seeing that I, I have the tendency to talk a lot, I'd hate to think how long these would be if I went every other week. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so for now, I will just keep the schedule loose, put loose and fancy free. And until next time, thanks for visiting. Have a good time. Bye.